Uh, good, welcome to our final session, session number six. It's been a, a very intense, uh, rich couple of days. We are very, so in a way, the path we have been journeying, we started yesterday with uh, the life. This morning, the first paper were more about the context, if you want, historical context uh, and uh, cultural context. Then we, in the following four, in the following two sessions, uh, this morning, and then the one we adjusted before, we read uh, some of um, uh, it's poetry, so we kind of delved into the Spring Harvest collection. With this final session, in a way, we're taking a step backward, okay? And we're having two papers, uh, in a sense, different from each other, but they share the, if you want, uh, the general perspective on uh, this poetry. The first will be by Ivano Sassanelli, who I shortly will present, and he will talk about, if you want, uh, the general vision of the TCBS, and especially the general vision uh, of Tolkien. Uh, and uh, uh, Smith in particular, bringing in the philosophical and the theological dimension of the conversation that we're having at that time. And then with Lucia Simons, so we're doing something again uh, different. Uh, we are kind of uh, working and thinking about the reception of Smith's poetry because Lucia is uh, preparing a translation into Spanish of Spring Harvest, the very first translation to Spanish. So she will, uh, in a way, share her experience as a translator, her challenges, and uh, the whole point uh, of this conference was to have a workshop, a place where you can work together. And I think we've been doing that. Uh, and both of these papers we're going to have tonight have the same purpose, and especially one by Lucia, uh, as she was said to me just before, she's very welcome to get any feedback from us. Okay, so it's a kind of a work in progress. But I'll start uh, introducing uh, Ivano Sassanelli. Ivano Sassanelli teaches uh, at, uh, at the Facoltà Italian Theologica Police di Bari, which is basically the theology the school, the Faculty of Divinity in Bari. He's uh, published uh, extensively a lot of different topics. He's quite well known, especially in Italy, for a big, big book of Gollum, which uh, he's translating now into English, and it should be come out next year for Luna Press. Yes. Is that correct? So I will leave the floor to him, and he will be talking about. Uh, Letter 130, sorry, no. one, five. letter number five. Letter number five, oh, sorry. He always talks about letter 142 or 141. <laughs> Today he's not doing that. He's talking about letter number five, okay? Yeah. So thank you very much, Ivano, for traveling a long way. There are, as you've noticed, a few Italians here have traveled a long way to be here, and Ivano is one of them. It's also his first time to Britain, so we're very, very happy to have him here to talk about letter five. Uh, Smith, on Smith and Tolkien's relationship. Thank you, Ivana. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this great and uh, precious conference, and uh, in particular, Professor Giuseppe Pezzini and my friend Oranzo Cigli for having wanted me here at Corpus Christi College in one of the oldest and the most prestigious university in the world. The topic that uh, I would like to deal with uh, in my speech is quite eloquent and challenging because uh, it touches the roots of the human soul and bends the relationship with the narrative art, the background today as in the past, is that of a time marked by war, by death, but at the, at the same time eager to rediscover the reasons and the forms of a life lived with the hope of a better time, of a renewed joy. At the beginning of the 20th century, four boys, Christopher Wiseman, Robert Gilson, Geoffrey Bache Smith, and John Ronald Revel Tolkien, since they wanted to change the world through poetry and the literature, formed the Tea Club and Baronia Society, better known as the TCBS. The name came from their habit to have a tea in the school library illicitly and in barrel stores near the school. This literary ideal and the very special friendship were tragically shaken by the Great War 
and by the blood shed on the altar of the princes. Precisely, in those battlefields, Rob Gilson died in combat. Token notified of the incident, a few days later wrote a letter, the number five of the correspondence edited by Africa on the 12th August 1916, addressed to G.B. Smith, in which he expressed in a moved way all his thoughts and feelings about the tragedy. Indeed, in that letter, he managed to express in a vivid and eloquent manner all his youthful ardor, his suffering caused by the war, the pain of a broken friendship, and the bitter realism that the end of the TCBS. Despite all this, in those lines, Tolkien also wanted to express the essence and the task of that group of friends and writers stating that the TCBS had been granted some spark of fire, certainly as a body, if not singly, that was destined to, kind, to kindle a new light, or what is the same thing, rekindle an old light in the world that the TCBS was destined to testify for God and truth in a more direct way even then by lying down its several lives in this war, which is for all the evil of our own side with large view, God against evil. These words are essential to understand both the friendship between Tolkien and Smith as well as the life, poetics, and the narration of the professor. Indeed, he believed that greatness could not be reduced to vanaglory, heroism in battle, or the exaltation of straight and fight. Instead, the greatness Tolkien referred to in this letter was the awareness of being great instrument in God's hands, a mover, a doer, even an achiever of great things, a beginner at the very least of large things. Therefore, the testimony, the testimony that the TCBS was called to offer to the world was that of giving one's life for God. This had to happen not in blind entrustment to a generic supernatural entity, but through conscious abandonment to a life project that far from lonely surviving could lead human beings to live fully, supported by the loving arms of God. Through all this, it is possible to detect Tolkien's Catholic soul in which the decision for God was fundamental and of crucial importance. He was aware that this decision had to be motivated by the awareness that the human beings are not monads and that they cannot do everything by themselves. Here it seems to echo the words that Pope Francis wrote in 2013, almost 100 years after the letter of 1916, in number 233 of the Apostolic Exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. In this document, this principle is important and clear. Time is superior to space. In fact, according to the Roman pontiff, giving priority to time means being concerned about initiating processes rather than possessing spaces. Time governs spaces, illumines them and makes them links in a constantly expanding chain with no possibility of return. What we need then is to give priority to actions with generating new processes in society and engage other persons and groups who can develop them to the point where they bear fruit in significant historical events. 
without anxiety, but with clear conviction and tenacity. Therefore, for Tolkien to be instrument in the hands of God and his providence meant exactly this. However, the question I would like to ask in this interpretation is the following. In his works and in his life, has Tolkien been faithful to the vocation of the CBS? In fact, in a letter published by Carpenter in the Tolkien biography, a few, year, a few hours before his death, J.B. Smith had entrusted his friend Ronald with the task of recounting his dreams and what had united the TCBS upon until then. In short, Smith was asking Tolkien to announce to the world the vocation and the greatness to which those four boys were called. They were very talented and eager to bear witness to the beauty, truth, and goodness of literature and, the, and creative art to human beings. In order to be able to answer the question we asked ourselves previously, we needed to frame the situation from two different but connected perspectives, that of the primary world and that of the secondary world. Indeed, God and truth are central topics, both in Tolkien's tales and in that connection between subcreative art and the primary history, which is called a catastrophe. If we start from the secondary world, we release that to testify for God means including what Tolkien has called the mystical phase towards the supernatural in history. In fact, as he himself admitted, something real higher is occasionally glimpsed in mythology, divinity. The right to power as distinct from its possession, the due of worship, in fact, religion. This is evident within the cosmogenesis recounting in the music of the Anu, in which the presence of God is decisive and shows a fundamental fact. Everything that a created being can do to contrast the marvelous work of creation actually serves to affirm even more the glory of God. In reality, in that story, Eri Luvata also includes in the music the dissonances caused by Mercury, creating a new and astonishing marvel. With the passing of the ages in Middle Earth, the figure of Eru appears increasingly evanescent, distant and his role, his role almost marginal. Actually, once again, in his works, Tolkien has shown the way in which God intervenes in harder, indecisive and critical moments. First of all, Iluvatar had introduced an essential novelty into the history of the world, creating his children and allowing the awakening, awakening of elves and men in Middle Earth. Secondly, Eru had, play, had played a major role in the fall of Numenor and the, the reshaping of the Earth. Finally, in the, third, in the Third Age, it was God himself who, through his grace and his providence, has accompanied some of the exceptional orbit of the shark. Bilbo and Frodo. In the event of the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, they were guided on a path made up of human growth and uh, choices to be made. These little creatures have lived their adventures within a project greater than themselves to which they had freely given their consent. Therefore, through his stories, Tolkien truly testified for God. Actually, 
In the letter number 183 of the 1956, it is written. In the Lord of the Rings, the conflict is not basically about freedom, though that uh, is uh, naturally involved. It is about God and his sole right to divine honor. The lordship of the God in the Middle Earth is peculiar. As Tolkien himself stated, Eir is the writer of the story, that one ever-present person who is never absent and never named. It, it could be said that Ilúvatar is a sort of Deus Abasconditus, who at the same time is present in the history of Arda in different ways. First of all, through what Tolkien has called miracles. It has supernatural interpretation that show the finger of God. Secondly, through the care and silent, faithful and constant accompaniment that he has had towards that tumbled who had opened their hearts to the appreciate of God and to the uh, adventure of human life. Tolkien was also a witness to the truth. In his essay on fairy stories, he has placed this theme at the center of the discussion on fantasy and on the subcreative nature of the human being. In fact, in the epilogue of uh, this essay, the professor stated, the peculiar quality of the joy in successful fantasy can thus be explained as a sudden glimpse of the underlying reality or truth. It is not only a consolation for the sorrow of this world, but a satisfaction and an answer to that question. Is it true? The answer to this question that I gave at the first words, quite rightly, if you have built your little word well, yes, it is true in that word. That is enough for the artist or the artist part of the artist. In these words, Tolkien values and the word view resonate. He conceived the beauty of artistic creation inextricably linked to the truth of what is narrated in this story, regardless of any other further purpose. This leads to a satisfaction and awareness that in fantasy there is a joyful spark capable of showing the goodness of reality present in the pages of a book. Therefore, in this context, the professor has shown how it is essential to recover the unity of what could be called the transcendentals of fantastic literature, beauty, truth, and goodness. Furthermore, the creation of secondary words is also unaffected by the possibility of abusing one's to creative art. Tolkien himself was aware of this and knew that fantasy can be pushed to heavy horizons and bent to destructive ends. But, like himself, he has admitted in the essay on fairy stories, abusus non tolli tusu. Fantasy remains a human right we make in our measure and in our derivative mood because we are made and not only made, but made in the image and the likeness of a maker. Precisely, Tolkien's refer re reference to the relationship between the creator God and the sub-creator man in terms of image and likeness opens the discussion to the last stage of our journey into the professor's thought about God and truth. In fact, 
always speaking of the truth of fantastic tales, he said. But in her catastrophe, we see in a brief vision that the answer may be greater. It may be a far off gleam or echo of evangelium in the real world. This means that the eucatastrophe, that is an unexpected and sudden reversal of the fantastic adventure that gives joy to the heart, allows us to glimpse that good news and evangelium exists beyond the pages of that book and it touches the deepest essence of the primary work. In short, the eucatastrophe is a narrative bridge through which the word of the author and the readers and the word of the narrative and the functional characters can met and illuminate each other. This is ever more true if we consider the every narrative of catastrophe as at its verification in the great catastrophe recounted in the Gospels. Indeed, in the epilogue, of the essay on fairy stories, talking and in the speech in this way. The gospel contains a fairy story or a story of larger kind which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. But this story has entered history and the, the primary word, the birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of man's history. The resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. It is not difficult to imagine the peculiar excitement and joy that one would feel if any specially beautiful fairy story were found to be primarily true. It is narrative to be history. Such joy as the very test of primary truth. It looks forward or backward. The direction in this regard is unimportant to the great catastrophe. The, create, the Christian joy, the Gloria, is of the same kind. This story is supreme and it is true. Art has been verified. God is the Lord of angels and of men and of elves. Legend and history have met and fused. Therefore, the incarnation, death, and the resurrection of Christ are not only the content of the gospel message, but they are also the unitary mystery of Christian joy, which is at, at the same time fonts et culmen of fantastic things. In this way, the narrative of catastrophe particip participates in the event of the ev evangelical great of catastrophe. On the one hand, this allows the truth lived in the secondary world to be a spark of what is true in the primary world. And on the other end, this connection shows itself as an evangelium or a joyous announcement of the fact that all subcreative faculties of the human being have been elevated to the reality of primary creation. Legend and the history have met and fused, and this has allowed God to be not only the maker of things directly created by him, angels and men, but also of all that has been sub-created by human beings. Through their fantasy, it has the elves and the world of fairy. At the end of this short but significant journey within Tolkien's thought and works, it can be said that in his life, as a writer, he managed to respect the mandate that uh, was left to, to him by his friend G.B. Smith, namely to preserve and pass on the mission and call of the TCBS. 
both in his uh, secondary world and in the development of his thinking on a catastrophe and the connection between creation and subcreation, the professor testified for God in truth. Tolkien accomplished all of this without allegory or forcing that could affect the narrative and its deep meaning of his stories. He simply has reflected on what happens when the wonder of fantasy meets the essence of Christian story. So, G.B. Smith was right. The TCBS was not really finished. It could not finish its function due to the trenches of the First World War. On the other hand, what had really changed was the perspective of the mission of this group of young artists called to be a witness for God and truth. Talking through his writing and his life managed to pass on the greatness of the TCBS. He has still allowed thousands of people to feel a spark of fire or a kindle in their heart, an ancient and a new flame. Moreover, the fantasy and the wonder can light the world even in the darkest times and indicate especially to, new, to the new generation a future of hope in a journey towards a far green country under a swift sunrise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivano. So we have now Lucia, who said a few things about Lucia. Lucia is a, is a student at the University of Gothenburg, and as uh, I said before, she's been working on a translation, a very close translation that I just figured out. So she's going to share about uh, her experience today with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. So there has been a translation of uh, the poetry of Judy Smith before, and that has been to Catalan. Uh, that is actually how I came in contact with uh, the translation of the works of Judy Smith. It was through uh, writing or helping to write the introduction to the translation in Catalan that had to do with the romantic influences in Judy in Smith's poetry. So naturally I had to read the poems as well and found that there were many things that I, that I really liked about them and that resonated with uh, what I thought good poetry could be. Um, so when I, when I did my internship uh, this past autumn, I got the chance to translate them into Spanish. And initially I thought this would be a very daunting thing to do. Uh, Maybe that I could have bitten off more than I could chew. Uh, but, and it's still a process, but this kind of opportunity to talk to all of you about this and to hear what your experiences on Smith's poetry and even Tolkien, who had, uh, they had a very important exchange, has been very, very helpful. And I hope that uh, my input here might be of interest to you, at least. In a, from a translation aspect. So, let's see. This. An arrow, use the right arrow. Uh -huh. okay. There we go. So, I have divided this uh, presentation into three challenges that I have identified. Uh, the first one has to do with cultural transference. The second one has to do with uh, rhyme. And the third one has to do with uh, the introduction of M notes at the end. But before I get into that, I would like to speak about the title of uh, the collection, uh, Spring Harvest, which in Spanish becomes something like cosecha de primavera, literally cosecha as in harvest, primavera, spring. What I found a bit uh, difficult about this title, however, was that in the original Spring Harvest, you you have something 
eerie about the title. You have the beauty of spring and the bountifulness of a harvest. However, when put together, uh, this becomes something kind of sad, something that has been harvested before its time. Mm. And this is something that I had a hard time transmitting in a, into Spanish language. Uh, I tried some other titles, uh, but I felt that they would stray too much from the original. And therefore, I leave the interpretation of the title to the readers uh, to maybe draw their own conclusions. From that. So, as I was saying, the first challenge was that of cultural transfer. Uh, there are words and concepts that don't necessarily translate very easily. Uh, obviously, that happens even in normal translate or normal uh, of prose. Uh, but this, in, in particular, was due to a distance in time. So, the language of uh, Smith was... Uh, it's not the language that we use uh, when we speak English right now. And as we have seen, Smith uses a lot of archaic terms or old words to, to have a certain effect on his poems. Uh, so this was something that in Spanish, you, you could, I, I couldn't just use the normal Spanish that I spoke with my family or, or with my friends or even in an academic setting. Um, I, had to, I had to refer to poems written in Spanish at that time uh, to see what kind of use of language they were employing or what kind of references they were making. But then I also had to take into account Smith's own use of even older words. Uh, that, and that was a big challenge because some of the old words are so historically charged that you find often a very literal translation or something lacking depth in Spanish, and that was something that I had to tackle. Uh, then there's the, the culture, of course. Uh, some words in English don't have a translation in Spanish that is direct. So if you have a concept that you can say in a singular word in English, you might have to employ three words in Spanish, mm. which is not necessarily a problem usually, but when you are translating poetry that can throw off the rhyme, that can throw off the meter, and, uh, and the entire visual look of the poem, you, you get sentences that are a lot longer, verses that are a lot longer and bigger poems. So uh, I had to decide pretty early on if I wanted to, to focus on the rhyme, keeping a poetic, uh, uh, a poetic sound to the poems, or if I wanted to focus on the, on the content of the poems. And this is something that I will also speak about. But um, to illustrate this cultural transfer, uh, there is the word quiet eyes that a lot of you may identify from many of the poems. Uh, and I have chosen a couple of sentences, uh, a couple of verses here. So for example, O oh, scholar gray with quiet eyes, here's in rhyme. But then we also have pale hands and faces and quiet eyes in memories. So these are two different sentences, or verses, I'm so sorry, um, that to me, when I read them, have different meaning. Uh, so first one becomes mirada sosegada, because it is a, a quiet eyes. I believe he's referencing the, the gaze, the, the, the look of, uh, of the scholar when he is gazing upon these uh, these manuscripts. Uh, so their mirada would be the, what I interpreted as the right or more close translation. And then sosegada, which means not necessarily quiet, that would be silenciosa. Uh, sosegada kind of transmits this uh, peaceful air to it, which I, I found was the, perhaps the, the intended effect. But this is of course my own speculation and what I have spoken to with other people that are interested in the subject. So I'm very interested to see how you would interpret, it, interpret it, this. Uh, then you have pale hands and faces and quiet eyes. The very straightforward is uh, pale hands and faces, manos y caras. 
so literally the hands in the, the faces and quiet eyes. And here it became what I, uh, what I said before, that quiet means silencioso and ojos mean eyes. Why, the reason why I felt that ojos would be um, perhaps the closer translation is because Smith is kind of saying he's naming parts of the body hands and faces, and the gaze is not really a part of the body in the same sense. So that is why you get two different, two different versions of what in English would have been the same word. Then we have, of course, grammary, uh, which is <laughs> a very... Uh, when I first read it, I didn't know what it meant. Uh, and it was today that I got even a, a clearer understanding of grammar, uh, if clear at all. Um, you find it in all in rhyme, of course, a scholar of grammar. And this, well, you also have it in a sonnet. All wisdom and grammar are written fields over a plain to see. Uh, the, the, the way that you can interpret grammar, on the one hand, you can say, the, grammatical uh, interpretation. But this became strange to me in, in, in a sonnet, because you say that grammar is something that is written fields, uh, or that. So, so the, the grammar uh, interpretation became a bit more, mm, it, I found that it was, it tied in more nicely with the, with the rhyme, or you can hear and see things. Um, however, when I first, and this is not the end translation, I have still not come up with a word that might uh, convey that which grammar is about to convey. Uh, a lot of people recommended me Arcano, which kind of, um, it kind of speaks to the more magical interpretation of grammar, something, an old wisdom, something that has been locked away uh, but however, in Spanish, Arcano comes with its own cultural significance that if you read it for the first time, might stray, might make you stray from the original meaning uh, that Smith wanted the poems to have. Uh, the same happens with a sonnet. Uh, so yes, if anybody has a, a good interpretation of grammar in Spanish, I am very happy to discuss. Um, then we have and, and this might be a bit surprising, uh, but scurrying was a tough word to mm -hmm. translate. Uh, not because of scurrying in itself, but because scurrying comes with skies, clouds, and sea, which in Spanish give it a different, it's a different, uh, different set of words to explain that. So you have in a fragment, gray scurrying skies, uh, then you have scurrying clouds that are scurrying overhead and scurrying sea. So scurrying skies would become would make the heavens and the skies revoltosos, which means um, troubled almost uh, with a sense of urgency, revolt. Um, so there you have revoltosos, but on the other hand you have clouds that se precipitan, that are eager, that are with the wind being forced to, to gain some kind of motion, some kind of movement. And that is, that is true for all of the scurrying, but especially here, because the clouds are wide, they're scurrying overhead. You, you can kind of imagine how the clouds are going. Uh, and the same with the, with the sea. There I also had to, to put precipitado uh, in the masculine in this case. Uh, because but I couldn't say, for example, so in the three poems, Smith uses scurrying, but in the translation, I have to use two different words, revoltosos and precipitados, which can may perhaps throw off the reader that it might have been very sure of the meaning in English and start out on what is meant in Spanish. Then we have Elbe. Uh, first, 
due to my Swedish background, my first initial thought was fire, eld in Swedish. But that was not the case. And when I realized that, uh, it all became a lot clearer. <laughs> uh, twilight of seas was in eld, and when was youth and when were the sea. The house of eld is the title of the house of eld. Uh, so eld to me was explained as something old, uh, a way of saying something, uh, something in the past. Uh, but I, I sense that there is more to that word. There are more subtle and uh, subtle meanings that are that are hidden behind that word that have, and and that the fact that Smith uses the word eld instead of saying something as straightforward as, as old tells me something that makes me doubt saying uh, edad anciana, which means old age. Um, so that, that is something that I am still dealing with right now. Uh, and here you have a different interpretation that is antiguo. That also, uh, it doesn't have the ring of the house bell. You, in, in English, you, you read the house bell and you're, you immediately have these, your, these images in your mind that don't really perhaps correspond with what you get in La Casa del Antiguo, where you might just find a, imagine a rundown house, something that is very old and in ruins, whereas the house of El implies something greater, at least to me. But that brings me to the second challenge, that it was the end notes, that I found that to explain all of this, I would need to... Uh, Perhaps uh, I would need to use more language than what the verse is loud. And for that, I tried to make a compromise between not being too didactic and, and just telling, simplifying the poems too much or making them too, making them stray too much from the original, while at the same time allowing and making them accessible for a, a reader that perhaps isn't familiar with a lot of the terms and a lot of the references that Smith is making. Uh, which is something that I did try to do since I found that uh, some of his poems are so fantastic that it would be a shame if people just turned away from them because they might have been too difficult to understand for a Spanish speaker. Um, so the West Wind, uh, for example, is uh, something that I struggled with in the end though, since it, ha it can have so many layers, as we saw before, that it has... Uh, it has uh, Celtic meanings, it can have ties to Tolkien or even classic things. Uh, when you, for example, when you look it up and do a very quick research about it, you find that um, the West Wind is something that, uh, that, is, uh, that brings happiness and spring and summer, which I feel is, some, is a bit too... It, it doesn't convey the, the multi-layered nature of the West Wind that I think Smith really wants to transmit through his poetry. So for, to make a, on the other hand, you can't have an end note that is uh, too long because then you're not making it as accessible as I hope to make it. But perhaps that is a, something to, to reevaluate and the, uh, and, uh, something of interest in its own. Then you have uh, Elsevier in Elsevier Cicero, uh, of course, he's making reference to, to the Dutch family of printers, uh, which is not something that any reader might be familiar with at the beginning and might be left wondering who, who is this Elsevier and, and why, why should I care? But it has a cultural significance that I, I thought might be interesting to put. On the other hand, I was very torn on, because you can start introducing endnotes and you can have them be many pages long because everything means something. So in this work, I try to identify what a contemporary Spanish speaker that might pick up this volume at a bookstore might or might not know. Uh, and the reason why I put them in the end is because I know that most of the people picking up these volumes are people that are going to be familiar with Tolkien, familiar with Smith, that will not need to access the endnotes. So that's why I, I choose to do endnotes instead of footnotes. Then, of course, you have Sainted Joseph 
uh, in, well, <laughs> Glastonbury and legend as a whole could have endless end notes. Uh, but St. Joseph, for example, is something that uh, when I, I let my, my sister and my friends uh, read the poems that they, uh, they wondered about. So the end note there would be something very simple, like very straight to the point, he was the one that brought the, the Holy Grail to England. And then the third challenge, and perhaps the one that is most conflicting for me, is uh, the challenge of rhyme. Because after all, that is what makes poems truly musical and beautiful and something that you want to recite and that needs a special kind of intonation. Um, so there is, it's very hard to, to create a translation that it includes both you often have to sacrifice one or the other. This is, however, very, <laughs> very uh, a shame in poems like Schumann, Erstes wird Lust, or Erste, as I learned today, wird Lust, uh, because it is meant to be sung as you so beautifully demonstrated. Uh, and in Spanish, you couldn't, you couldn't sing it in the same, with the same, kind of notes or the, the language wouldn't allow it. Um, so here is an example of this. Yeah, the sky's overcast, leaves falling fast. So, so there's this, you have, it's, it, in this specific poem, I think it's very clear that it's intentional. The, the rhyme and the meter is intentional because it's, it's meant to be read in a specific way. Uh, following the musical piece by Schumann. Uh, and that goes completely lost in a, in a Spanish translation. That is, uh, this is not finished, but this is just like to, to explain how much it, it you see how the, the verses are a lot longer and it, it's truly, it's a shame in poems like these, uh, which is why I hope that through the translation, I know, not only offer uh, an, uh, poems to an audience, but offer them the, the, the want or the, make them curious about what the original actually says, uh, since that is the, the best version. In C poppies, you have, uh, the case with C poppies is that I, when I read it, I feel like this is the, the way that it is written reflects the the narrator it's in he's in a trance he's bewitched uh, there's kind of this incantation and that's how i read the poem it's it's it has this very through musicality and the the meaning of the language uh smith transmits this this kind of slumber this kind of kind of mm, being bound by some magical ropes and and that, of course, that incantation type of uh, effect gets lost. Um, but I, I try to do, uh, try to kind of convey that through the language instead, since I couldn't do it with the with the rhyme. Uh, that puts that makes the the content even more uh, necessary to get right. And then there is uh, the case of a sonnet uh, where, yeah, you, you get the same thing here. Here you can see how long the verse is to come and how um, it's, yeah. I guess that my point is that you, when, when forsaking the rhyme, you really need to get the content right because then otherwise you lose both and that, that cannot be accepted. Um, but at the same time, so you have to make the decision and you have to stick with the decision because it would be kind of strange if you had one poem that is that does rhyme and then the next one that doesn't, that visually and that doesn't really have the same effect that the anthology of poems set out to have. Um, so, when, I, when I'm still translating this, I'm 
these are some of the questions that I deal with, that I, that I, that I ask myself and that I'm not entirely sure of yet. So, which is why hearing you speak here has, uh, has given me so many insights. I'm very, very thankful to you for that. Uh, and I will be revisiting the drafts uh, with, through this new lens that I have gained through this conference. Um, and then I will also be adding new endnotes where they may be needed or removing the ones that might may be a bit redundant or unnecessary as to not make them too long or try to or trying to profile the kind of reader that will be getting the book. Um, so that is all I have for today. Thank you very much. So we have got about half an hour for the discussion. Yeah. I have already a few questions, but please. Well, thank you both for the great presentations. Uh, I have a, a brief question with uh, Trevano, and maybe a few questions for Lucia or Trevano. I know that you're like, very keen to sort of highlight the, the theological, religious, Catholic background of Tolkien and his work and what he's doing and his purpose. And as you well said, that's very clearly stated in his, uh, in our fairy stories and in, in, uh, in several of his letters. So I was wondering if you would have a way of explaining, like, why, why do you think that he was purposefully um, revealing God in his text? Like, why doesn't he? Uh, I mean, there's, there's no religions, there's no temples uh, in Lord of the Rings, and why is he so keen on? And even though we know he doesn't like allegories, there seems to be like an intentional avoidance on the subject, and surely there must be a reason. So I was wondering, like, the other way around, what would your uh, ex explanation be? So that if you thought about it. And for Lucia, I mean, a ton of stuff, but uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I won't go into any of the like, specific options, but maybe two quick comments on the title. You, I was wondering why did you avoid the una cosecha and just left there? Because it seems to me that in English it does ring, it, it, it gives it a specific ring, it, it uh, invests it with some form of contingency, and then you avoid that in Spanish. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing there might be a reflection behind it. On grammary, I was I mean, I can talk with you later about this, but Arcano sounds interesting, but I was thinking that maybe options that highlight the fact that it's a discipline, a study, something like that, like a field, maybe, uh, could sort of uh, allow you to maintain this idea that he's studying something, and yet this thing that he's studying is odd and mysterious and ancient, but avoiding the sort of magicality that Arcano so you might, if, if I read Arcana in Spanish, the first thing that comes to mind is he's uh, looking at the ball, almost. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that's not what it's intended. And then finally, um, would you consider, I mean, you've talked about end notes, but most, would you consider um, an addition that, you, that includes an explanation of what you were saying, or even including both English and Spanish? Uh, side by side, because that sometimes is useful, and I do believe that you're doing an incredible work, not only an incredible job, not just translating, but you're shedding light onto the way the author is understanding the words, skirting from what well, I understand means to move quickly, but looking at the different cases in which Smith uses very, it's clear that he's talking about journeys or ship or, and I mean, it's kind of fascinating, so that's it. Shall we start with the first question to revive? And then the second one. It is an important, important, important topic that uh, I, I wrote, uh, I have written about this in an article that will be published in uh, uh, a book of Luna Press. Maybe in some summer. And uh, uh, the title of my article is. Uh, who is Eru? Question mark. Because it, it is a, a, there are two things. Who is Eru? 
and why is a uh, uh, the depth of scomplete. That's the first question. In my opinion, Eru isn't our God. Eru is the God of the secondary world. And so, the manner in which uh, he is present in the secondary world is uh, uh, is influenced by the narration and the type of the, um, the things that uh, Tolkien wanted to, to say, wanted to express, or uh, influenced by his uh, fantasy. I have, uh, uh, I have found uh, uh, an interesting thing. In uh, the Beowulf, uh, Beowulf uh, Monsters and the Critics. Oh, no, in the comment of the, uh, about the, the Beowulf. Because uh, um, there is, uh, in uh, the last part of this book, uh, edited by Christopher Tolkien, a part uh, in which there is uh, a Tolkien study about uh, uh, the, mm, the God and the world. And in this, uh, in this text, uh, it's uh, clear that uh, um, the fact that the author of the Beowulf stressed the presence of God in Beowulf is because in that time there wasn't uh, um, a large difference is a large difference between faith and God, because uh, we were in uh, ancient ages. And, uh, the, the Christianity is uh, young, and so there. And uh, Tolkien uh, says, but this. Uh, um, constantly uh, refers re, re, references to God now in our ages is irrational because in the mind uh, in Tolkien's mind in my opinion there is the <laughs> maybe a mistake there is a mistake the mistake that uh, uh, we know the differences, the difference between faith and God. And so, in in his world, he wasn't, uh, he, he don't, he didn't want these uh, irrational things. And so, he uh, he prefers a presence, a God presence, very very light. But uh, mm, strong at the same time. Also because uh, in the third age we are in in history, not in legend. And so in legend, in the first uh, age, we see Eru. In the second age, we see the fall of, Num of Numenor. Uh, by Eru, by the, in the third age, that is the, the history, huh? we don't see God, but we know for Christians or for uh, religion people that, they, that he is present and uh, he has a work in our world. Yes. So the first question was about uh, why I chose not to include Una. Una uh, Can you explain what Una is? Una, Una is A. Una. So, so oh, like sorry. the yeah. A part. Yeah. Aspray Morris. A. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why I think was because um, I was influenced by the Catalan uh, translation where they did omit it. And that was the inspiration for the Spanish project. 
On the other hand, I also thought that una cosecha de primavera might give the idea that this was one of many different ones, which kind of, it, I think it works, and I'm, I'm reevaluating that choice, but I, I struggle so much with the idea that the title meant so much more than just the words, that I wanted to give it special, in some way, kind of reinforce the fact that it was something out of the ordinary. But I, I hear what you're saying, and that might be something that gets revisited. Uh, and great suggestion with, uh, with grammar. Uh, now the, the challenge would be to find a discipline, an established discipline that, that would transmit this idea. Uh, which, yes? I, I just have a, a, a thought, but I don't know if it would work. Because the Latin term, grammatica. Grammatica might be a very, mm -hmm. because then by using a Latin term, you're, you're also doing what Smith is doing by. Yeah. It's very, very good. Mm -hmm. I also thought that you might, I don't know again, if it would work in Spanish to use the Latin name for the West Wind, Aurora. Wow, okay. That is <laughs> great. This is so helpful. <laughs> 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 you grammaticas. And that's completely yeah, grammaticus, because that, that would be Spanish, it, it sounds old. Exactly. So, yes. The law actually called Sasso Grammaticus, who wrote the legendary history of the English case, so that was actually a thing. That makes it even more, that has such, I'm bringing that with me. Federica Faust, Federica Strong. Federica Faust. Okay, and also for Lucia, the just because we tell you this, also the same, you know, at the end, when you deal with the divine part, you know, and the sonnet, when the last last part, when he translates just like, completamente olvidado, mm. uh, that's right, all forgotten. All forgotten, yeah. uh, But uh, we have this sentence also in Italian, his word is upward, that just uh, make the right so slow, you yeah. know. Maybe a solution could be delayed the word completamente, uh, mm -hmm. okay, just because uh, I, I think that this similarity with Italian olvidado is forgotten, but frankly forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe just to shorten the final words, I don't know, it yeah. could be a solution. Yeah. It is Spanish, because I do know Spanish, so, but I see the similarity with Italian. So how would that be in Italian? Completamente dimenticato, but I will delay completamente, but just use dimenticato, it is olvidado. Yeah, All right. Just yeah. delaying the doctor, because it's our words, uh, our word is too long, mm. too, yeah. too much to pronounce it. Yeah, <laughs> especially in comparison with all forgotten, which is yeah. a very economical word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just That's a true. suggestion. Yeah. Right? I'm gonna bring that and and look it over. So that's that's very good. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, I just have something to suggest in support of trying to use a string marvels or mm. string marvels or mm. so Una. Um, I think that was very intentional by the editors, Tolkien and Wiseman, especially Tolkien, because in saying a string harvest, the whole idea is someone who harvested in too young mm. for their time. So take it out of this world. Mm -hmm. By by using a spring harvest, they're quietly recognizing that G.P. Smith was one of many mm -hmm. such young men yeah. who was harvested yeah. and then died on the stage. Many had volumes published under the so very similar circumstances. Mm -hmm. So by saying that, what they're saying he's special to us, but we're recognizing that he's one of our many great blossoms that are very similar for all the people as well. I think that A actually has very great meaning and I would try to include it and maybe give the historical explanation of that that is, that's that's very good. I think as well that nothing is lost really by adding Una. It's not too much if anything it becomes even more similar to the original. Uh, so thank you for that reflection. I, I hadn't come to that conclusion myself. It's very very interesting. Thank you. John? Uh, yeah, that's a question for each of you. Um, uh, Ivano, um, a point that you made, I think you said that uh, the, the 
letter from Smith to Tolkien where he said, I'm a wild and hard to admire and so on, it was written shortly before he died. Uh, and I take it, and someone else said something similar, I think, yesterday. Um, and I assume that this is through reading of the carpenter, who uses the phrase, not long before he mm. died. Um, point of fact, it was 10 months before Smith died, exactly to the day. It was the 3rd of February, 1916. Mm -hmm. Which means that Tolkien's letter to Smith about the death of Gilson was almost exactly the halfway point between Smith writing that letter and Smith dying. Um, and I wonder if that changes your perspective at all on um, the, you know, the, the, the dialogue between them about these years. Mm, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, uh, because I think that uh, Tolkien in all his life um, has, uh, or had, uh, in, in his heart, in his heart, the, mm, the memory of the TCBS. And in my opinion, uh, that memory was uh, is, uh, is past, but also is future. The fact that that kind of friendship was so strong um, is, make, makes him uh, an, an expected courage. Because uh, in my opinion, the, the works, Tokyo's works, are uh, maybe a uh, I don't know maybe a, a, a hope for him to revival that experience that primary experience so it was the, maybe uh, the last the, or, or the most important author of uh, that group but uh, he was the author of the TCBS. And so, in my opinion, uh, he, he want, because uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that letter, Smith uh, says that, uh, uh, to Tolkien, to remember him, remember uh, Smith, to remember his, uh, uh, his views, his... Uh, um, also his uh, uh, poems oh. and uh, Tolkien's edited the letter so the first part was respected and so in my opinion also that uh, passage uh, was respected so uh, in my opinion Tolkien was convinced that he has the um, the mission to testify for God and truth also when the TCBS was definitely broken. And it was the... Uh, Tolkien is like a continuous TCBS. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, I want to say. Um, Yes, it's the, the, the future of the TCBS. Um, when I look 
looking at what you're doing, and you're looking to choose when you see a, a word with uh, polyvalences, ambiguities, or a phrase you know, with a quiet eye, uh, you are having to select between them. And in that way, you are, you are narrowing, delimiting the choice of readings. Right? And also, you're removing some repetitions. So we see quiet eyes repeated three times in the, in the whole collection, but you found two or three different phrases for it. Um, I'm curious to know, oh, before I ask the question, another, another point, uh, two points. <laughs> um, if you had, a, so a, a two pages of a the book, they're great for a bilingual side-by-side uh, text. But really, surely what you need is, um, can we have a translation that's literal and a translation that's formal? So in other words, a translation that conveys the music and the meter and rhyme if possible. Never mind the meaning. And what that conveys the meaning, never mind anything else. You know. um, or three pages, you've got the English there too. Um, <laughs> another point. This is a wild and uh, possibly foolhardy thought. Could the title of Spring Harvest be an acrostic for Ash? Well, Ash, but, I'm sorry, but, uh, totally untranslated. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is very funny. That, that's how I, but when writing about it, when yeah. Yeah. Ash, it's not Ash. 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 It is. Um, so, but my final point. Actual question: When 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 you are removing those ambiguities and repetitions, repeated echoing phrases, do you find that you are also introducing some? Yes. So, in a sense, you're creating an alternative artwork yeah. that speaks with its own resonances. Mm -hmm. Is it almost unavoidable? It, it is unavoidable. I think that my hope is that to create something that can stand well on its own and inspire the reader to, to see the original as well, to, to see what it is that has been lost in translation, to, to find out for themselves. Uh, but perhaps that wouldn't be necessary if, if with that idea that you said, the, the having a translation that is focused, solely focusing on meaning and having one that is focusing on, on the rhyme, I, I actually did that before translate, before deciding, uh, I took five poems and I tried to make a, a translation with rhyme on all of them and a translation solely on meaning. And then I, because I didn't think this was a possibility of, of having it all, <laughs> I, I showed them to people and I read them myself and the consensus was that the rhyme one became too, I had to in a in a different language as well, you might you might have um, say a handful of possible translations required, but then when you have to rhyme them, maybe you're narrowed down to one, or maybe to none at all. Uh, so you're left with nothing to work mm -hmm. with. Um, but um, that would be an interesting thing, uh, and it would take a lot of work, which is uh, very exciting as well, uh, because it, it kind of needs a completely different reading of, of the translation. Uh, and to answer Eduardo Zazon, uh, he also plays the question of uh, having both the original and the translation side by side. I think that would be a nice, a nice way of letting the, the reader choose how mm -hmm. they interpret the poems. So that, thank you. Yeah. Oops, can I say something so I'm jumping in? But, uh, just to follow up uh, uh, on the question that was asked to, to Ivan, which uh, for me opens up a big methodological question about using the letters to infer something about talking stock. So we're using a corpus of letters uh, dating from, uh, uh, I think the first one would be 1915 and 16, and we have the letters dated to the late 70s. Just for in that, so 60 years of letter in a single book, they were written one after the other, and it's very tempting to make connections in a sense. Uh, so, how do we deal with that? Okay, so how do we, and uh, I think uh, a way to do it and, uh, in a sense of bringing something to support, uh, um, I must point to a certain degree, would be to use really some sort of intertextual analysis, meaning that one thing is the thematic correspondences, okay, so ideas that are recurrent. Others are like keywords 
that come again and again and again. So there is a keyword of talking, which is found both in letter 5 and in letter 328, which is the one that the draft letter mm -hmm. uh, was written in 1971 to uh, whatever it's at two, but basically it's interesting that uh, in that letter we find that the, figure, the word instrument again, which mm -hmm. is also found in letter number five. Is that enough? Uh, I mean, both letters talk about uh, talking's perception of the location, and in both cases you have the concept of instrument. But also if you, you compare those two letters, it's not just the word instrument, but you also have the word of the idea of light. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a beautiful metaphor used by Tolkien now of uh, the publication of the Lord of the Rings and the Rights of the as such has been some sort of uh, uh, event. Uh, indeed, uh, the metaphor you were using, I recall it, because it gives the idea of a sunrise that has never been seen for a long time, and it's mm -hmm. the light of a sunrise which has not been seen for a long time and comes back again, which again recalls very clearly uh, the image of creating a new light. Is that enough? Difficult to know, okay, but I think in this particular case, maybe the fact that these two letters uh, deal with the same topic, uh, using some the same key words may suppose the idea that actually talking was, uh, I don't know how much conscious, okay, but uh, in a way it was going back uh, to his own self perception of his dislocation and his inception, okay. And I do think that to a certain degree of uh, uncertainty is unavoidable, okay, but there were a bit more of an analysis of keywords of talking to come back again and again, they had. In this particular case, I think Meta 38, uh, if I have this suggestion to mm. read, uh, I strongly suggest the argument this self perception has been uh, fulfilling the testing of the uh, location of the TCDS or something actually clear, okay, you know, something that just looks to us. Maybe it is a, an, a letter uh, by Tolkien to um, a, a woman that says, who says that uh, uh, there is a, a sort of faith in the Lord of the Rings. And so, it's one, it's one, yeah. he's, he's, Sorry, he's, he's, uh, I think there were many more. Uh, I remember who was the first. He's very, very first. Okay, uh, Ivana, uh, one question for you and one question for us. Yeah. So, uh, Ivana, you mentioned uh, uh, the um, pace of the mystical, the mystical mm, pace, mystical uh, pace. Uh, of fairy stories. Uh, yes. And, and so, as a kind of, of, of an example or instance of how uh, Tolkien could justify a problem mm. by writing mm -hmm. fairy stories. Mm. Uh, but I think that in the you see it in the context of Tolkien's of, of own fairy stories. Fairy um, stories uh, testify for, or may testify for God. They may, be, may give a glimpse of, of the gospel by being fairy stories. And it is an essential characteristic of fairy stories to have three faces the mathematical, the mystical, yeah. and the mirror. So um, uh, there, is no pri there is no priority for the mystical. Face in order to to give this glimpse. Actually, he says that they can be present in in different uh, proportions. In different, so and and uh, so uh, a story in which the mystical face is present to a small proportion is just as just as uh, capable of giving a glimpse of the gospel as if it's if it is as if it has a, a big proportion. Do you see what I mean? Thank you very much for this question. Thank you. Yeah. Because uh, it is uh, the point. Because fairy stories has an essential phase that is magic. Mm -hmm. The second. Yes. The other two are uh, optional. But the fact that Tolkien put the mystical phase in his uh, uh, stories is uh, the sign that uh, it is important. Also, even if it is short, because it is an optional phase. Tolkien, Uh, a, a writer can uh, can write uh, a fairy tales without mystical face, but Tolkien put it, and put Eru 
in a central position. In first age, in second age, the fall of Numer is, is a rule that falls Numer. The third, the third age is different. There is a, a substantial difference between the, the presence of Eru and the manifestation of Eru. The fact that Eru is not uh, immediately manifest, ma in my opinion, is not important. Because the presence, the Eru's presence, is a, a fact with his grace, with his providence, with a, a providence plan. And also because uh, um, the writer of the story is Eru, is not in the fictional, is Eru, is not Tolkien. So, in my opinion, the fact that there is the mystical phase is uh, a fundamental point because it is a very, very optional phase in that case. Uh, tennis and then even and even yes. Yes. yes, thank you very much for both papers and for the presentation. In relation to fame and errors, what I find particularly fascinating is that I think the elves, for, for, for elves, faith is not an issue because there, there, there are, especially in the Indian and Grand Banks, maybe it is an issue for the elves who remain in the middle of like their body because they have to take on faith that what they, what's all of it telling them is the truth. So that they have witnesses like come back. So, but for men, Faith is a very, very important matter because uh, they have not seen any of those and they have to trust, and which is not quite the same as faith. It's a, a trust for the elves tell them, and of course, that makes it, it makes the, the challenge of our women do the most, mm -hmm. the, the, the key, the key on the whole, because for Aragorn, has faith that there is an afterlife. That they look somewhere else. But poor Arwen, she's been an elf all her life, and faith has never been an issue for her. And now she's mortal and she doesn't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. But she was born in the lab, that's important. Okay. She was born in the lab. Yes. You can go out, I think that's an important detail, I think. But nonetheless, I mean, she has parents who have told her, and she, has to, she takes it on trust. If you have trust, you don't need faith. So, so that's that was my reflection that came to me as I was listening. Yes, but to the, paper and your presentation, and for me, it, it clarified something really deep about what happens in the tale of Aragorn and Arwen, which I had mm -hmm. never realized before. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, as far as I'm concerned, that's mm -hmm. the gem. <laughs> yes, for 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 uh, human beings, and uh, in particular for Hobbit. Yeah. And it is the problem of, uh, of the religion. But uh, for men, uh, religion and the, the religious aspect is not uh, about cults, but about an opening to a, a, a something higher. We don't know. Who, no. but the, the 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 opening of their soul to other things, the the call, a call, an opening uh, to a call, a higher call, by Gandalf or, or by elves or um, by something. Else. This is the religious aspect of hobbits, in my opinion. And in relation to uh, your presentation this year, I, uh, I, as a translator, I'm translating French of Tolkien's pieces, and uh, uh, it's an it's, it's, it's extreme challenge. First, the translations of Tolkien's poems were not necessarily of the best quality. The adventures of Tom Bombay, 
because she was mm. taking the horrible pain. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's terrible, it hurts just to read it because it has nothing to do with it. The late of Bayernian, the tale of Bayernian and Lucien, they kept to the octosyllable in French, mm. which is like a an impossibility to manage because yes. French French is a more verbal language than English. Mm -hmm. Most words in, in French are of one and two syllables. Mm -hmm. Most words in French are of two and three syllables. So if you want to say the same thing in French, you need to take half as long as in English to say the same thing. So basically, the Alexandrine works well in French because it's exactly mm -hmm. twelve syllables for the octosyllabic eight. And so the, the in the French edition, mm -hmm. and that's all the more striking because it was a bilingual edition. <laughs> it's like, you can't, I personally cannot understand what you said on that page on the right hand side of the book because uh, so much is left, is left out, is lost without a trace, and that's a shock. It, it's an incredible shock. So, when I work at it's a, an ongoing work. Mm -hmm. A translating Mythopoeia into French, which is uh, uh, the most meaning, the, it's the most embedded meanings of anything that Tolkien has actually written. Mm -hmm. I, I, I sort of, I, I had to sort of, I, I agree with you, meaning has to come first, because without the meaning, what else is left? And then so a line stretch out. By locating to rhyme most of the time, I get some very pleasing assonances, occasionally alliterations, but but true to the meaning, in a way, the, the, the Italian expression traduttore, traduttore, mm. so translate a traitor, a translator cannot betray what they're translating, but if 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 we can sort of minimize the betrayal, uh. then I think that the job will be done. And that happens with several of the translations, the world's last song, the song of Ariator, and things like that. And it's an incredible challenge, but it's also something uh, intensely satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, we don't have a lot of time, so two final questions from Eden and Dimitrios. Thank you both for your really interesting presentations. No questions for Lucia, uh, very quickly. Um, I just wondered if considering the word eld in its verbal sense could be helpful. Um, just because it ends in a D, it sort of sounds like a past participle anyway, even though I think the examples you gave you use using it as a noun. Um, it's almost like elded or to, to be made. Eld. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that way, I can only speak for what the English means. Mm -hmm. um, you can sort of get the sense of infliction or damage or harm, but also development or maturation when a thing is mm -hmm. elded. Um, and even in the word eld, it's as if the L, L E L E D, I, I looked it up, it's, it's not a word, but it's almost as if the additional. Fantasy E has been allied with. Um, so maybe that helps develop the sense by looking at it as a verb. Yeah, that, that's a very good idea. Just L as a word is, it's since it is so particular in English as well, uh, it, it becomes very hard to use a very normal word in yeah. Spanish to, to, to use translation. But I'll look into that. Uh, I'll say it's past. Thank you. Give us last question. Thank you both for your presentations. I have one question for you, Lucia. Uh, it's specifically about uh, metaphors or similes that you might have encountered uh, in uh, Jimmy's and uh, I mean, and trying to translate them. How, how much difficult is it when you're trying to uh, switch? Uh, yeah, that is that is a very good question since they are so particular to the language. Uh, I think that what I would do is try to, because you can translate it literally when the metaphor is lost. Uh, I think that at best what you can do is to see what they are trying to say and try to convey it in a way that might, if you're lucky or very skilled, uh, then uh, kind of work pretty well as, as a translation, but yeah, you can definitely, 
I would, I would definitely not translate it literally uh, as a metaphor because then you're, you're betraying the meaning uh, and you're probably not doing anything good for the rhyme either. Yeah. So. Has it been difficult so far? Um, yeah, yeah, it is difficult, uh, especially with metaphors that might uh, transmit something that isn't very usual in, in Spanish. So, so then you have to, to try to introduce something new, uh, a, a new not only concepts, but maybe any way of seeing things or of uh, perceiving a situation uh, at the same time that you're you're not saying it with, with a metaphor that is already established in Spanish. Maybe there are metaphors that are uh, si similar enough that you might use them, but that's not always the case. So the difficulty lies when they are, you, you don't see any clear uh, equivalent. Very uh, good. I think it's time to wrap up and conclude our fantastic uh, today conference. I think it was great. I will give it a lot of applause. We start to the next of the central operation. We discuss some of the special friendship, meaningful friendship with Smith uh, and Tonkin. And I enjoy a little bit of the session, uh, which we have experienced a beautiful collaboration. We said, which is very beautiful about it. Uh, been together been doing the past couple of days and walking together, sharing thoughts. So thank you very much to all of you, not, not just for being here, but also for contributing to the questions uh, with your comments, with, with your curiosity and passion in general. So as we, I was saying yesterday, that's the first of a series of events that we are organizing at University of Moscow, together with Grace and Mark, Stuart uh, and other colleagues uh, from other colleges. Uh, uh, I can anticipate a couple of things. Uh, so there will be another academic scholarly conference on the same on the 3rd of September. Uh, I think we plan to um, release more information uh, in early April or right after Easter. And we'll be again here at Corpus, but there will be a few exhibitions around the town, and Exeter, and so they are preparing one as well, and also they also are available, you may see. And so there will be a kind of an opportunity to be here and also again together for the actual day of the anniversary, which is the second of September. Then next year, there will be a weekly seminar in Oslo for the whole year, for 24, for 24 weeks of the Oslo terms, which will ideally conclude in the spring summer when there will be another important event, uh, this time in London, in the Sarabia, where finally we should have. Uh, the unveiling uh, of uh, a monument of uh, a art of a sculpture dedicated to call talking in what's called. So it's a kind of a big uh, project for the whole of the year. Next step will be, uh, I think, September. I there will be actually, if I mentioned it already, Gabriel, what's happening in Pembroke in May? Is it, can we? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe later, maybe later. Sorry, so there are a few other things that say, there are a few other things that happening, okay? So keep on. Uh, uh, how do you how would you hear about that? So, so if you go on your program, there is an email address so the, the, uh, and you can send them this email and we will add to our newsletter. If you have lost your program, you just can just write to me, okay? You can find me So the hopefully 2023 2024 will be again the of celebration for JLRT. What about so they, so we uh, are organizing an exhibition on that for the days uh, of, uh, of this conference on the second of the So we get an exhibition on topics as well as on and of myself, but also when they are mandated to discuss uh, uh, what was actually going to be there. But and there will be a bit the same also next year. Okay, so we there is a network of people that are starting to build slowly, and the idea to bring together everyone in the university of Boston talking at quite a few much. And the uh, idea yeah, would be to, uh, at this conference, uh, for those days, there will be also, there are also notes, so we expect a lot of talking people coming. We lie as we talk in society, not the notes of our main page, to many of the last, but the idea of the conference would be not ours, but would be academic scholar, like the kind of conference we can do together in this couple of days. Thank you very much again to all of you, to all the speakers, uh, today, yesterday, and uh, have a nice time uh, back home. Thank you very much. Thank you. So tonight there is no dinner, but you can talk to some of us who will be going to class and so on. So we'll give you a thumbs up to get, but uh, there's no formal dinner.
For the people uh, who are here for the night, uh, I will ask you to do uh, the checkout tomorrow morning with the camera. Okay, I think it's 10 a.m. possibly, but I'm sure you have received uh, uh, all the information from you wanted to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Oggi quante? Oh, mi sa che oggi ho firmato 23. Hey, we'll bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, nice to meet you. Non ce l'ho. Non ce l'hai. No, è importante.